The public health hysteria over MSG is just that, an irrational fixation driven in no small part by anti-Asian xenophobia. There is no particular reason to fear or avoid MSG any more than you should fear or avoid the other ubiquitous food additives in our lives. I'm pretty sure what I just said to you is true. I mean, that's the basic scientific consensus these days. It is also true that the processed food industry has spent a lot of money to build and popularize that consensus. Should that give us pause? I don't know. I have no hesitation about eating MSG. In fact, I'm going to show you some of my MSG cooking experiments. But there is some research indicating that a small number of people can experience mild adverse reactions when they eat a lot of MSG. And I mean a lot. Perhaps more significantly, scientists are now exploring whether MSG might be a causal factor in metabolic problems like obesity and type 2 diabetes, though that research is in its early stages. The best single text I've ever read about MSG is this University of Toronto doctoral thesis by Dr. Sarah Tracy, a historian of science and food. She's got a book coming out soon about MSG, and much of what I'm about to tell you is drawn from her research. MSG, of course, stands for monosodium glutamate, the sodium salt of glutamic acid, which got its name from gluten, the wheat proteins that make bread dough all stretchy. German chemist Karl Heinrich Rithausen first isolated glutamic acid in 1866 by treating gluten with sulfuric acid. And yeah, that doesn't sound very wholesome, but glutamic acid occurs naturally in tons of whole foods, in particular meat, tomatoes, mushrooms, and seaweed slash algae. Our bodies also make glutamates inside of us from other amino acids that we eat. Another German scientist named Hermann Fischer described the taste of glutamic acid as insipid. Indeed, the acid alone apparently does not taste like much, and it wasn't the focus of much more scientific attention until a Japanese chemist named Kikunai Ikeda came along. He studied in Germany for a while, and then while researching Japanese seaweed broths, Ikeda isolated monosodium glutamate and called the taste of it umami, which roughly translates to savory or yummy or both. By 1909, Ikeda had developed developed a process for mass-producing MSG. It was cheap to make, chemically inert, shelf-stable, heat-stable, easily dissolved in water, and it tastes, well, you should try for yourself. Pure MSG is widely available in grocery stores. Here in the United States, you can just go to the spice aisle of any mainstream supermarket and look for this brand name, Accent. Look at the back, it has one ingredient, monosodium glutamate. So the first thing that strikes me is that it's way less salty than salt. To me, it's immediately recognizable as the taste of processed snack foods, which of course are literally coated in MSG. Defenders of MSG say its reputation has been unfairly tarnished by its incidental association with these industrial food-like products. The powder itself, these defenders say, is natural. But while glutamates do occur in nature, Dr. Tracy would not call the contents of this bottle natural. That's a, a product that is created in factories by processes of industrial fermentation. And the way that companies source the glutamate is that they, they use particular strains of bacteria to excrete it into these big tanks. And then they harvest the glutamate and then they stabilize that amino acid with sodium molecule. So it's a product of industrial manufacture, just like a million other things that we eat. Indeed, gross though that may sound, industrial fermentation is how we get a lot of things like vitamin C supplements, ascorbic acid. It's also how we get insulin for diabetics. Should you care that MSG is not natural, at least in one scholar's opinion? I don't know, I don't really. Some of the deadliest substances on Earth are 100% natural. Here, have some botulinum toxin. It's all natural. The real question is, is MSG harmful? Unfortunately, that totally legitimate line of inquiry has been permanently muddied by the bizarre case of a 1968 letter to the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. It was, in retrospect, a weirdly momentous event in the history of food, and the history of food is a topic I've been learning a lot about lately thanks to the sponsor of this video, Curiosity Stream, whom I shall now take a brief moment to thank. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of really great documentaries and nonfiction titles from some of the world's greatest filmmakers, including exclusive originals. I've been watching this terrific five-part series on the history of food. But how did we go from hunting and gathering on the Serengeti to grabbing a snack from the fridge? Perhaps the answer was as elemental as the kiss of fire. 
take that, raw food advocates. Cooking is what enabled the rise of civilization, says science. There's so many great films here about anything you're curious about. My older son and I like watching the nature shows together. You can watch them via the web app, the mobile apps, Roku, Xbox One, Apple TV, whatever. CuriosityStream was created by the founder of the Discovery Channel, and compared to other streaming services, it is astoundingly cheap. You can get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month or $19.99 for a whole year. And because you watch me, your first 30 days are absolutely free. Just go to curiositystream.com slash Ragusea and enter the promo code Ragusea. I've got a sign up link with that code down in the description. Do us both a favor and check it out. So yeah, about that 1968 letter in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was sent by Dr. Robert Homan Kwok, a Chinese American physician and researcher in the Washington DC area. And the journal headlined it Chinese Restaurant Syndrome. After eating American Chinese food, Dr. Kwok complained of numbness at the back of the neck, gradually radiating to both arms and the back, general weakness and palpitation, basically a mild fever. Now I've read a lot of the subsequent scholarship about this letter and the public health panic that it sparked, and I think I've come up with the right analogy to explain what was going on here. These correspondence pages in the New England Journal, this was not the rigorous peer-reviewed research part of the journal. This was Reddit. This was r slash medicine. This was a place where doctors of that time could talk shop and kick around ideas that were not ready for prime time. It's also a place where doctors joked with each other. And we know that the New England Journal in particular had this tradition of doctors sending in prank letters about joke syndromes. It was like proto-concern trolling. We don't know what Dr. Kwok's intention was. We're not even even totally sure it was Dr. Kwok, because in 2018 a guy named Dr. Howard Steele came forward and claimed that he wrote the letter as a hoax. That probably wasn't true, but even if you take the letter at face value, Dr. Tracy points out that Kwok is just kind of spitballing. It was like, I don't know if it's the sodium, I don't know if it's the wine, I don't know if it's the MSG, all I know is I experienced these symptoms, how about you guys? And then it became this cultural phenomenon, as moral panics often do, and it was a bandwagon effect, and it happened to coincide with this moment um, culturally in which people were very invested in sticking it to the man and critiquing the influence of big companies, of environment, environmental degradation. It, it was in the late 60s and early 70s. This was very of the moment. Hey, farmer, farmer, put away the DDT now. To do that expose mode of, aha, what's behind the screen? What are you hiding in our foods? And also a moment of great stigma around immigrant populations and what were they doing in the back kitchen that we don't know about? Yeah, it's gotta be that foreign science powder they're putting in the food. I mean, why else would I feel bad after eating an absurdly large portion of white rice with batter-fried chicken chunks covered in a cornstarch and sugar sauce with enough salt in it to attract wandering deer out of the woods? I mean, why else would that make me feel bad? For the record, I freaking love American Chinese restaurant food, but yeah, scholars now regard Chinese restaurant syndrome as a xenophobic moral panic and not a real medical thing. But it is also true that there is a huge amount of money to be made with MSG, and Dr. Tracy's research documents how some of that money has paid for MSG's rehabilitation. And now she's worried that we might be in the midst of a cultural overcorrection. The argument about Chinese restaurant syndrome having been racist and anti-science and discriminatory, it acts as this really powerful smokescreen for other questions about corporate interest and the, the bias that goes into scientific research. And I think both are important. And it should be said that real science has shown some health problems associated with MSG. The first thing researchers looked at in the 1970s and 80s was whether MSG might be a neurotoxin. Because that was the theory at the time, that MSG could, in the food supply, have the effect of overstimulating neurons in your brain and causing them to die at an accelerated rate. So there were studies that, using very large doses of MSG, often delivered um, by needle. They were given as an, as an injection or in very high, high amounts. They did result in um, strange symptoms like lesions. But of course, we're not out there on the streets shooting up huge doses of MSG. So this has not persisted as a big area of concern for scientists. What about when we, you know, eat the stuff? Well, here's a very widely cited report commissioned by the US Food and Drug Administration in the 1990s. The researchers here concluded that some small subset of the population does indeed appear to experience mild symptoms like the ones Dr. Kwok wrote about, folks with asthma in particular. But even those experiments involved people eating at least three grams of MSG on an empty stomach. You want to know what three grams of MSG looks like? 
Yeah, that's a lot. That's probably not what you're eating. These days, the focus of research is on whether MSG might be a direct contributor toward problems like obesity. Glutamates in our body are deeply involved in processes like appetite regulation. And while the jury is still out on that, Dr. Tracy has what I think is a very good point. She argues, in her thesis and in her upcoming book, that MSG is certainly an indirect contributor toward obesity. Why? Because it makes terrible junk foods taste really good. This kind of, um, I hate to say addictive, like this really delicious, irresistible almost combination of enhanced flavor and crunch and aroma and, and all the things mouth feel that make us want to eat a million Doritos. I really buy this theory, and I'll tell you why. I brought this bottle home thinking, OMG, this is going to be the magic secret ingredient that revolutionizes my home cooking. The first thing I tried it in was a homemade mushroom stock. I feel terrible about wasting mushrooms from mushroom stock, so I usually just make it with the stems that I take out of the mushrooms that I plan to put in my risotto. Yes, that recipe is coming. Anyway, it's not quite enough mushroom to sufficiently flavor a broth, so I figured I'd goose it up with a little bit of MSG. I put in a few big pinches, and then some more, and honestly, I could taste the difference, but it was not transformative. Then I tried putting MSG in tomato sauce. A lot of people on the internet say this will revolutionize your red sauce. I shook some in, then I shook some more in, and some more, and honestly, I could barely taste it at all in there, which led me to this personal conclusion. MSG doesn't do much to improve the taste of things that already taste good, or at least things that already taste savory. Indeed, I had the best results when I sprinkled MSG on my standard workout meal of bland tilapia and cauliflower rice. What MSG is really good for is giving taste to something that otherwise would taste like almost nothing. Like a Cheeto is virtually indistinguishable from a starch-based packing peanut until it gets coated in the magic flavor powder. Here's a fun experiment you can do. Get yourself some normal tortilla chips, the ones that are just corn, oil, and salt. Sprinkle some MSG on there, and then all of a sudden, that tastes like a Dorito. There's no cheese powder, no other seasoning, just fried corn, salt, MSG, and to me, that's totally a Dorito. Though when I mentioned that to Dr. Tracy, she pointed out that Doritos have other things in them too. Things that work synergistically with the MSG to be even more tasty, namely these flavor potentiators called IMP and GMP. Science is amazing. Science is amazing, but it has also taken foods that are terrible for us and made them addictively delicious. And that may prove to be the biggest health hazard posed by this ubiquitous white powder. Now it's all over my kitchen.